I am going to get us started. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I have so much to cover in the next hour and a half. This really is one of those uh, class sessions that could have been a course unto itself. So we're gonna we're gonna cover a lot of material tonight. We're you're gonna drink from the fire hose of Protestant theology and Christian Zionism, and you're gonna come out the other end with all kinds of thoughts and ideas and new new ways of thinking about Christians in the state of Israel. So let me share my screen, and we're gonna get going. Um, oh, right. okay. Um, so we are talking about um, Christian Zionism tonight, um, and uh, I want to do some history. I want to do some theology. Um, we're gonna we're gonna get into it. So, but just as a reminder, oh, this is not even the right link. Don't use that link. Use the one in the chat. Um, so uh, my colleague Katie is gonna drop a link in the chat um, that will connect you to our um, Slido, uh, which is our app for managing Q and A. So if you have questions, or if you want to vote on other people's questions, just click on that link that Katie just dropped into the chat, and um, it will open up a browser window for you. You can type in your questions. Um, you can make them anonymous. You can put your name on them. You can vote for other people's questions if you want them to go to bump up the list, and we'll try to have hopefully five to ten minutes at the end to, to talk about those. So let me do a quick review of what we talked about last week, and then we'll segue into um, tonight. So as, as we talked about last week, Jesus and all of his early followers were Jewish. Um, and so and we, we talked about how this gradual separation, the separation, what was called the parting of the ways between Christianity and Judaism, it did not happen in the first century. It did not happen really in the second century. It took a long time for um, these identities of Christian and Jewish as separate entities, as different religions to really congeal probably several centuries after the lifetime of Jesus before you really can articulate a clear, a clear distinction between these two communities. Now, that process of emergence of Christianity from Judaism left this Christian tradition then with an ambivalent and mercurial relationship with Judaism. Right? As you have this emergence, you find texts, you have know, communities and texts and voices in the early Christian tradition that are leaning hard towards kind of a continuity, a fascination with an embrace of Jews and Judaism that leads ultimately to what we talk about as the philo-Semitic uh, facet or, or aspect of Christian theology. You also have time at some communities that are repulsed by and rejecting Jews and Judaism. And these things get baked into early Christianity, into the early texts, into the early sources. So they, they become recurring themes in Christian theology of kind of Christian um, views, theological views of Judaism that often have very little to do with actual Jews, right? Very often very little contact with actual Jews. This is kind of, these are Christian theological ruminations and traditions that um, emerge and um, you still see this today where you have uh, a lot of Christians have a lot of thoughts about Jews, but they might not know any Jews, right? But it's it's a theological imagination that they're participating in. And we looked at how the anti-Semitic or supersessionist side dimension of Christian theology has contributed very directly to violence and pogroms against Jews, to conspiracy theories that emerge uh, in Christian communities about Jews, and then ultimately to the rise of modern anti-Semitism in the Holocaust. What I want to do tonight is think about that other side. What, what about the philo-Semitic aspect of Christian theology? Where does that lead to? And one of the places it leads to um, is something that happened five years ago this month, and that is the dedication of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. So a um, little bit of background, and then I'm going to actually play a little uh, video clip for you um, from, from the, the ceremony. Um, so the, the U.S. Embassy, like all other uh, embassies to Israel, was in Tel Aviv. Um, and that, that was kind of the recognized capital of Israel by the international community. And then in um, the fall of 2017, just a, a, a few months into the Trump administration, um, the... Uh, State Department uh, in, in the Trump administration announced that they were going to move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And um, this is a very controversial move. The U.N. Um, sees Jerusalem as a contested area that is claimed by both Palestinians and Jews. And so it cannot be, in the U.N.'s view, the capital of Israel, at least not right now. 
But the U.S. was making a statement, and, and Paraguay and, and Guatemala actually followed the U.S. in this respect to move their, their embassies to Jerusalem to say, this is what we are now recognizing as the capital of Jerusalem. Interestingly, the AJC conducted a survey amongst American Jews shortly after this move was announced in 2017, and to see what do American Jews think about this. And what they found is fascinating. They found 16% of uh, American Jews supported this move, right? 16%. Now, another 36% of American Jews looked at this and said, ah, we're, we are, we're in favor of potentially moving the, the embassy, but that should happen later down the road as you have progress in some of these peace negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians. And another 44% of Jews in America said, no, this is a bad idea. We should not be doing this. And, and it should not happen, not now, it should not happen later, it should just not happen. And so if American Jews were not supporting this move of America moving the embassy, well, who was? Shocker, it was the Christians. 53% of US evangelicals supported this move, right? which is a large chunk of Americans. And so this led to Donald Trump in an interview with Mike Huckabee on Fox News, Making this comment, well, the Jewish people appreciate it, but the evangelicals appreciate it more than the Jews, which is a fascinating statement, right? It tells you a little bit about how Trump, why Trump was thinking about this, why he was making this move. So I want to show you a, a little video clip um, from the ceremony. Um, so the just to give a little bit of, of a setup here, so this is the ceremony that's happening in, in May of 2018, the 70th anniversary of the uh, founding of the state of Israel. And on stage with, uh, you, you, at, this is during the invocation, the prayer at the beginning of the ceremony, um, you have two prayers. One is offered by Rabbi Zalman Wolwick uh, of Chabad, and one is by Robert Jeffress, who is a Trump evangelical advisor and a Baptist pastor from Texas. And also on stage with them is um, David Friedman, who is Trump's uh, ambassador to Israel. So as you watch this clip, it's about two minutes long. I want you, so you're going to see part of Robert Jefferson's prayer. It's a very long prayer, so I had to choose a portion of it. But he, he you're going to see two minutes of his prayer. And I want you to listen for what he's saying. But at the same time, I want you, want you to watch the body language of the people around him as they're reacting to his prayer. Okay, so we're going to take two minutes and then we're going to think about this a little bit more. All right, here we go. So grateful as we think about what happened 70 years ago today, at this very moment, when you fulfilled the prophecies of the prophets from thousands of years ago and regathered your people in this promised land. Now, we want to thank you, especially today, for the courageous leadership of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his determination to do whatever it takes to protect his people at all costs. We are equally grateful for the skillful work of our ambassador, David Friedman, who so effectively represents our United States policy of always standing by and supporting our most reliable ally and friend in the Middle East. And now, Father, as we come to dedicate this embassy in the city of Jerusalem, the city that you named as the capital of Israel 3,000 years ago, we want to thank you for the tremendous leadership of our great president, Donald J. Trump. Without President Trump's determination, resolve, courage, we would not be here today. And I believe, Father, I speak for every one of us when we say we thank you every day that you have given us a president who boldly stands on the right side of history, but more importantly, stands on the right side of you, O oh God, when it comes to Israel. And now today, Father, we want to pray what the psalmist prayed 3,000 years ago. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love her prosper. May peace dwell within her walls. And we pray this in the name and the spirit of the Prince of Peace, Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Um, so I would say that this move is, uh, this, this prayer, and really a lot of the ceremony is an expression of Christian Zionism. 
So let's let's talk a little bit about definitions here. So what is Christian Scientist? So Robert O. Smith has a good book, um, more to be or more desired than our own salvation, which is a history of of Christian Zionism. And here's his definition. <clears throat> he says Christian Zionism is political action informed by specifically Christian commitments to promote or preserve Jewish control over the geographic area now comprising Israel and Palestine. I think that's a good definition. Um, I, I have a slightly revised definition that might, might boil things down slightly. I would say that Christian Zionism is a form of philo-Semitism that entails Christian support for the creation and endurance of the modern state of Israel for theological reasons. So there, there might be Christians who support the state of Israel because they like Israel, or they think it's a good ally, or they want the U.S. to have an ally in the Middle East that shares some sensibilities. That, that, that's all fine and good. I wouldn't call that Christian Zionism. It could be a form of Zionism, but it's not coming from a Christian theological perspective, right? So I want to talk about Christian Zionism within the realm of Christian theology, and why it comes from Christian theology. Now, let me give you a few stats about um, the U.S. relationship with Israel. When Israel, when the U.S., when the, the state of Israel is declared in 1948, the United States is the first country to recognize Israel and to acknowledge it. Today, Israel is the largest cumulative recipient of U.S. foreign aid, and the the um, the Congress, the the House and the Senate have passed legislation that requires over this the decade that we are in right now the U.S. to send at least $3.8 billion a year of military assistance to Israel every year, right? $38 billion over 10 years. And that's not even counting some of the missile defense stuff that the U.S. also provides. The U.S. is the only nation to recognize the Golan Heights, um, which the U.N. designates as Syrian territory occupied by Israel as part of Israel. The U.S. is the only one that, that, that looks at that, that territory and says that's actually Israel. And the U.S. and Guatemala today are the only two nations with embassies in Jerusalem. Guatemala did it following the U.S. move in, in 2018. Paraguay also followed the U.S., and then they wound up retracting that. So why? Why is the U.S. so invested and so connected to Israel? Well, in 2013, Pew did a survey where they asked American Jews, American Christians, and the American public in general, what do they believe on this particular question? And the question was, was Israel given to the Jewish people by God? It's a very interesting survey. So what they find is um, within the Jewish community, it is actually quite conflicted on this question. Only 40% of U.S. Jews agree that God gave Israel to the Jewish people. And if you look at among Jews who identify as religious, that jumps up a little bit to 47%, but it's still less than half. Even of religious identifying Jews in America, would say that Israel was given to the Jewish people by God. Again, this goes up notably if you look at the Orthodox community, and especially the modern Orthodox community, but that's not the majority of Jews in America. Now, compare that to the U.S. general public in 2013. The U.S. general public, 44% said that Israel was given to the Jewish people by God. So the U.S. public in general was more supportive of the idea that Israel was given to the Jewish people by God than the Jewish community in America as a whole, right? And then you look at the Christian numbers, right? So if you if you look down at the Christian numbers, amongst Christians, 55% of all Christians in America agree with this question, more than half. And if you look amongst the evangelicals and amongst the other Protestants, right, you have um, 80 2% of evangelicals, 47% of mainline Protestants, and 51% of Black Protestants. And then it drops off very significantly with Catholics. And so we'll talk some about why that is. But if you actually turn these statistics into real numbers in terms of the actual population, what you find is, according to this 2013 study, about 2.5 million American Jews believe Israel is given to Jews by God. 2.5 million. But Christians are enormous portion of the U.S. population. And so that 55% translates into 120 million Christians in America who are supporting this idea. And even within that Christian community, more than half of that support is coming from within the evangelical community. 69 million American evangelicals are supporting that. 
So I would argue, based on all the data that I've given you right here on the slide, that Christian Zionism is a huge determinative factor in this unique relationship between Israel and the United States, right? You have to be trafficking in the worst kinds of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories if you believe that 2.5 million Jews, less than 1% of the U.S. population, are compelling U.S. policy with regards to Israel, right? You, you don't need to search for an explanation <clears throat> as to why the U.S. policy is oriented the way it is around Israel. It's coming out of the Christian community, especially this evangelical community. So where does this Christian Zionism come from? Well, in order to get there tonight, I need to take you a little bit into the weeds of Christian theology. We're only going to go like three feet deep into the weeds. And then we'll come back. You'll be okay. Um, and we're going to go into Protestant theology, especially, to work on this. And along the way, hopefully you'll expand your vocabulary a little bit and hopefully be able to understand better why these dynamics exist. So tonight we're going to be talking about something called Christian eschatology. Eschatology is the, um, it comes from the Greek word eschatos, which means the last or the last things. And so eschatology, the, that part of Christian theology about the end of time, about the end of the world. And this is significant here because the Christian theological concern with Jews and Judaism is not merely retrospective. It's not merely trying to make sense of the origins of Christianity within Judaism and the relationship between the two. That's part of it. We talked about that last week. But it's also prospective. It's looking towards the future and trying to make sense of the role of Jews and Judaism and Israel at the end of the world. Right? So it's not only trying to make sense of the origins of Christianity, but the end point of Christianity, what the relationship between Christianity and Judaism will be in the end. <clears throat> so some of the types of questions that get asked in the realm of Christian eschatology are things like, what will happen to the world or creation at the end of time? Will everything just burn up? Will we all be spirits? Or will there still be matter? Will creation still matter? What does it mean for Jesus to come back? Sometimes talked about as the second coming of Jesus. What, what does that mean? How is that going to happen? What will happen to the church at the end of time? What will happen to the Jews and Israel at the end of time? Will there be a messianic kingdom in history, something that is contiguous with our time and our lifetimes? Or will it be a kind of something that, that happens after the end and some, some future that we can hardly imagine? When will these things happen? And in what sequence will they happen? And when and how will God's judgment occur? And for whom? So these are the types of questions that are driving the Christian eschatological conversation. And the types of source material that Christians have is actually quite a bit. So there's there are a lot of passages in the Hebrew Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament. There are a lot of passages in the New Testament that look towards a sort of apocalyptic future, or at least some sort of future, and offer comments about God's will, God's intentions for the future. So you get passages from the Hebrew Bible, like Amos chapter 9. I will restore, this is God speaking through the prophet Amos, I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel. And they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them upon their land. They shall never again be plucked up out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. It's the sense of a future era of prosperity, of restoration, right? These are the types of things that Christians are looking at. Or if you look at Ezekiel chapter uh, 11, Right? Therefore, say as God speaking to the, the prophet Ezekiel, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. When they come there, they will remove from it all its detestable things and all its abominations. I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh so that they may follow my statutes and keep my ordinances and obey them. Then they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And when we think about the New Testament, you get passages like Jesus. He has this, this apocalyptic discourse, uh, kind of speech in the sermon in the, in the Gospel of Matthew. And towards the end of that discourse, he says, This good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all the nations. Then the end will come. So there's some sense of a global message, a global proclamation of Christianity that has to happen before the end of time right? Or Romans chapter 11, one of the most famous 
passages in the New Testament with regards to Jews and Judaism, where the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Rome, says, I want you to understand this mystery. A hardening has come upon part of Israel, right? Paul himself is Jewish, just speaking about his fellow Jews, until the full number of Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. What does that mean? As it is written, and he starts to quote the prophet Isaiah, out of Zion will come the deliverer, and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And he quotes the prophet Jeremiah. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As written, this is again the voice of Paul now. <clears throat> as regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their ancestors. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Again, there's a wrestling that's going on in the mind of the Apostle Paul and his writings about what is the relationship between his movement and broader Judaism. And then maybe one of the most famous passages um, with regard to eschatology comes in the book of Revelation in chapter 20. Um, so vivid imagery, it's kind of common of the book of Revelation. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And so this image, again, of a thousand years that is kind of this messianic era uh, in the future. So we, we, we spoke last week about Augustine and this, this, the, the very significant influence he has on Christian theology, especially around Jews and Judaism. Well, Augustine also has a very important impact on Christian eschatology. Christian eschatology up until the time of Augustine was pretty scattered and amorphous. But then when Augustine comes along, he really creates an early medieval synthesis that becomes very central to Western Christianity, kind of a, a watershed moment. In a lot of areas, Augustine does this, and he does this as well in eschatology. So Augustine comes to this passage in Revelation 20 about the thousand years, and he interprets this thousand years, the sometimes called the millennium, sometimes called the messianic age, as a symbolic and indefinite period between Christ's first and second comings. And in that time, Christians reign with Christ through the church, and this position would later become known as ah millennialism. In other words, Augustine is saying that this millennium, ah is in no millennium. So Augustine is saying there, there, this millennium, don't, go, don't get too literal here. This is just a symbol. It's just referring to the time that we're in right now. Don't worry too much about it. So in Augustine's interpretation, then, uh, these Hebrew Bible and New Testament promises of Israel's redemption or restoration or exaltation over the nations, all of those get fulfilled behind the Christian church, which he talks about as we looked at this last week, the spiritual Israel over and against carnal Judaism, right? So this is, again, that legacy of supersessionism. And Augustine says, hey, all those promises, we get all those. We Christians get all those promises. And we're going to fulfill all the promises. And so for Augustine, um, Jews aren't that significant eschatologically, right? And this becomes the position of the Catholic Church even today. Some Protestants also hold on to this amillennial view. You can remember it as ah, as it starts with A, just like Augustine. So this is that kind of mainstream Christian view throughout the Middle Ages. So Paula Fredrickson is one of the great scholars of Augustine. Uh, this is how she sums it up. Jews will remain Jews, Augustine averts, until the end of the age. The conversion of some Jews to Christianity in the time before the end thus has no eschatological significance, whatever. Since, as a people, Israel as Israel shall endure until the end of the age. So put it differently, Augustine wants Jews to convert to Christianity, but it doesn't bear any significance for him eschatologically. Now you fast forward a little more than a thousand years and you come to the Protestant Reformation. I'm going to talk quite a bit about Protestant theology tonight. So I want to, I want to give you a quick overview of how Protestantism works or doesn't. Um, so we're going to talk some about some of the sectarianism that emerges and some of the terminology that comes into Protestantism. But Protestantism really kicks off in the 16th century um, with what is called the Protestant Reformation. We should probably use the plural Protestant Reformations. There were a lot of different movements that all were kind of operating in parallel. But the central concern, 
central question of the Protestant Reformation, as you have this contiguous Roman Catholic church with its theology that's, that is pretty coherent and holds together, the question that arises in the 16th century is, who gets to read and interpret the Bible? And underlying that is this deeper question of, where does authority come from in the Christian tradition? And the Catholic Church is saying, well, authority comes from the church. Authority comes from the traditions of the church, the teachings of the church, and those go sit alongside Scripture, right? They sit alongside Scripture and, and, and interpret Scripture. But the Protestants want to say, no, 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 no. Scripture has its own authority that is independent and cannot be overruled by the teachings of the church. And so you get in the 16th century four major movements of what will later become called Protestantism. You have the Lutheran movement, following on the teachings of Martin Luther. You have the Anglican or Church of England movement, following on um, the leadership of Henry VIII. If you remember the whole sad saga of the family of Henry VIII, the divorce that he wants, the, the from Catherine of Aragorn, the, uh, Anne, the marriage to Anne Boleyn. All, all, go, go watch some 16th century dramas about Henry VIII if you need that history. But you have the so you have the Church of England, the Lutherans, the Reformed tradition, which comes sometimes, often referred to as just Calvinism because John Calvin is such a pivotal figure in that movement. And then you have what scholars today call the Radical Reformation. At the time, they were just called the Anabaptists. And so you get these different segments of Protestantism or Protestant theology and identity. And then over the course of the next few centuries, those subdivide into what we talk about as denominations, right? So the denominations emerge out of these four streams. Sometimes they're blending the different streams. Sometimes they are entirely attached to the different streams. If you encounter a Lutheran church today, you can pretty much guarantee that it goes back to the Lutheran tradition of Protestantism. But you have others like the Congregationalists and the Presbyterians that are coming out of this Reformed tradition, or the Puritans who are blending the Anglican and Reformed traditions, right? And this is um, the, the dominant mode of Protestantism for about three centuries, is these, this sectarian, Protestant, schismatic world. And the denominations are very relevant and important to people's identities. Then in the 20th century, those denominations fade into the background. They still exist. People, many Protestants still belong to denominations, but the salience and significance and importance of those denominations recedes. And so instead, you have people emphasizing major coalitions, major movements. This is especially in the U.S. It's true globally as well, but it's more complicated globally. But in the U.S., you have basically three, maybe four major um, coalitions of Protestants. You have mainline Protestants, who tend to be the more traditional Protestants, the more liberal Protestants. You have historically Black Protestants, who um, many of the uh, Black denominations and movements begin pre-Civil War and then really flourish after the Civil War. Um, but these were Black African-American Christians who said, well, we're not going to be second-class Christians. We're not going to sit in the back of white churches, and we want to ordain our own Black leaders. And the white churches won't let us do that, and so they had to form their own churches. And that has become a very robust strand of Protestantism in the U.S. Uh, context. And then you have evangelicals, who tend to be more conservative, more focused on evangelism. And sometimes uh, people will break out Pentecostalism as a separate tradition. Sometimes it's under the umbrella of evangelicalism. It's a complicated question. We can talk about it separately. We'll look at that a little bit more next week. But these are the more salient divisions amongst evangelical or amongst Protestants today are these kind of coalitional identities that emerge. One of the other things that is happening, though, in the Protestant Reformation, as you have all these Protestants reading the Bible afresh, and with different eyes and different lenses, is you have a wide variety of interpretations. And one of the things that happens is this really uncorks the bottle on eschatology, right? Among the many effects of the Protestant Reformations was the opening of Pandora's box with regard to Christian eschatology. If up until that point, things were pretty much set, the tone was pretty much set by Augustine, well, the sky's the limit in the Protestant Reformation. So Calvin and Luther and, are, and the more what we call magisterial or erudite kind of scholarly reformers, they mostly adhere to, to Augustine's view. They mostly adopt this amillennial position and, and kind of run with that. But the Anabaptists, these radical reformers, and some of the later reformers really won't go to town with their apocalyptic theories. One of the earliest people to do this is a guy named Melchior Hoffman. 
Melchior Hoffman is a, um, a, a student of Luther's. He's a, a missionary, a, a Lutheran missionary, uh, a layman who's in Strasbourg, which is uh, modern. It, at, at the time, it's more under German control, but today it's in France, so Strasbourg. Um, and, and so, but then over time, uh, after, after a few years of being a Lutheran, Hoffman decides that he's going to switch over to Anabaptism, and he adopts this very wild eschatology. So he declares uh, that God has revealed to him that the world is going to end in 1533, uh, which is 1500 years after the death of Christ. Um, and he declares that Strasbourg is going to be the site of the new Jerusalem, this eschatological kingdom of God. I know this is going to shock many of you, but Jesus did not return in 1533. And um, so um, Melchior Hoffman's movement did not, did not come to much. But a couple of his followers really said, well, you you got some good stuff going here, Melchior. We're going to run with this. And so these two uh, leaders especially um, decide, who are followers of Hoffman, who really appreciate his theology, wind up going and founding the idea of the Anabaptist kingdom of Munster. Munster is another city nearby, near to Strasbourg. And so um, it's, it's especially the, these guys, Jan of Leyden and Jan Mathis, they take up this millenarian theology and they take control of the city of Munster um, and start to declare that Munster is going to be the new Zion, the new Jerusalem. And um, they go really to town with this stuff. So they they start to rebaptize citizens in the city. They rebaptize 1,400 citizens. So Anabaptist just means baptizing again. They believe in adult baptism. And so people, uh, these are Christians. These are Christians who are baptized as children, but they're now being rebaptized. Um, they start, instead of calling them Christians, they start to call them Israelites. They institute compulsory sharing of property, sort of uh, primitive communism, but also polygamy and the sharing of wives. And so men in the town are forced to share their wives with other men because this is somehow seen as a revelation from God. Amazing how that is always a revelation from God when you have male prophets. Um, they they name the, the, ten, the town leaders the 12 elders of the tribes of Israel. And at least if you believe, we don't have a lot of sources from inside the Anabaptist kingdom of Munster. It doesn't last for very long. But if you believe outside sources, they're also start executing people who disagree with them. Now, this, of course, cannot last for very long. And so after about a year of this, the um, local Catholic bishop starts to muster an army and overthrows the Anabaptist kingdom. And it becomes kind of a, 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 a byword, a kind of a warning tale to, to other folks. And the, the, the Calvinists and the Lutherans are actually very supportive of this, even, even though it's the Catholics that overthrow the, the, our, the kingdom of Munster. The Catholics and the Lutherans, or excuse me, the Cal Calvinists and Lutherans say, yeah, this should not be allowed to per persist. This is giving Protestantism a very bad reputation. So, right, once you open up interpretation of the text, wild interpretations are going to flow from that. Now, all of this Protestant ferment that's going on in Europe comes across the Atlantic into the American colonies, right? As you have these different Europeans from different national and, and, and religious combinations coming across the Atlantic into the, the colonies, well, there's, there's this potpourri of Protestantism that moves its way across the Atlantic as well. This is the map of the different predominant religious communities by geographic area in 1750, so about 25 years before the, the American Revolution. And as you can see in the green, there's big sections that are Anglican. They're following the Church of England. Um, there are, uh, including the state of Maryland, um, there are, there's a, that section of New England that's congregational. That's the old Puritans coming out of the Reformed tradition. You have um, some sections, some smaller sections that are Lutheran, some tiny sections that are Presbyterian, which is kind of the, the Scottish version of Reformed the reform tradition. And then you have these smaller little pockets of Baptists and Roman Catholics, some tiny pockets of Jews. There weren't very many Jews prior to the American Revolution in, in the colonies. And you have these reform churches, Dutch and German and French and Quaker, all, all kind of sprinkled around the colonies. So the theologies of Protestantism, the theological debates and arguments of Protestantism come into the American colonies. Now, when we think about Christian eschatology, there are some basic building blocks. And we already saw this, some of the primary sources, but I just want to delineate them a little more clearly. So these are some of the, 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 the core things that Christians are trying to arrange when they're coming up with what is a, a Christian eschatology. 
Jesus is coming back. What does that mean? When does that happen? This is one of the things that Christians have to locate in their eschatology. There's this image of this thousand years, the millennium, this Christ's messianic reign on the earth in Revelation chapter 20. When does that happen? How does that happen? Where does that happen? Right? These are the types of questions. There is a mention also in the book of Revelation that God will make all things new, that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. When does that happen? Does that happen before the millennium? Does that happen after the millennium? And then we have this idea of the resurrection of the dead for the afterlife. Okay, so now reviewing what Augustine said within this, Augustine says the millennium is right now. We're living in this millennium. Christ is reigning right now. The church is reigning spiritually on the earth. And then we'll find the resurrection of the dead and then the second coming of the judgment and then the new heaven and the new earth. This is the amillennial approach. And because Augustine is such an important figure, this really becomes the mainstream view of Roman Catholics, of Eastern Orthodox, and of some Protestants. And this is part of why you don't find a lot of Christian Zionism in Catholic communities, because most of them, at least officially, are amillennial. They aren't worried. Jews don't, and Israel don't have an eschatological significance for them. Now, the other two positions, I really want you to pay close attention on this part, because we're going to send you into breakout rooms, and you're going to have to make, make a choice here. So the other two uh, forms of this, the other two forms of Christian eschatology, of Protestant eschatology that emerge, are both called types of, and these are synonyms, millenarianism or millennialism. They're both referencing that a thousand years are just slightly different English words that mean the same thing. So millenarianism or millennialism. And there's two forms of this, and they're pretty easy to remember. One of them is called post-millennialism, and one of them is called pre-millennialism. So you've got amillennialism, the position of Augustine, and then these are these two forms of Christian eschatology that really emerge in Protestantism post-Reformation. There, there's threads of them that go back earlier than Protestantism, but they really congeal after the Protestant Reformation. So in the post-millennialist view, the millennium is going to come about through the triumph of the church, which they also view as the triumph of good over evil, Right? and the transformation of human culture into the kingdom of God. And then you have the second coming, and then you have the resurrection of the dead, and then you have the new earth. Okay? So for post-millennialists, the church builds the kingdom of God on the earth. Now, pre-millennialism wants to say, well, first you have to have the second coming or the rapture, right? You need Jesus to come back. And this is where the idea of the rapture comes from. And I'll, I'll get into the rapture in a little bit. I know somebody threw a question in there. But... The, the, you don't have to have a rapture in premillennialism, but most premillennialists do believe in the rapture. And then the millennial will come, right? And then in the millennium, Christ is literally going to reign on the earth with the church, and everyone's going to submit to God. And then you'll have the resurrection of the dead and the new heaven and the new earth. So post-millennialism, the church does it on its own, builds the kingdom of God, takes over the world. Premillennialism Christians evangelize to the world, and then Jesus comes back and changes everything and, and, and sets the world away. Okay? So here's where we're going to go into our breakout rooms. So you've got these two major forms of Christian millennialism. And that, that these are predominated amongst Protestants, and especially amongst these evangelicals and Pentecostals, right? So post-millennialism is the, the, the church builds it. Pre-millennialism, Jesus has to come back and fix everything. Okay, and the okay, let me give you a couple art images that might might help you anchor this a little bit more. So this is a, a very famous uh, painting from American history. It's called the Peaceable Kingdom. It's by a Quaker artist named Edward Hicks. It was painted around 1830. This is a perfect image of post millennialism. So here you have lions laying down with lambs. This is a, a famous prophecy from the uh, from Isaiah. You have little babies playing with the lions and the lambs and the wolves, right? The, the, the animal kingdom has come into alignment with God's intention and everyone is hunky-dory, right? And in the background, it's kind of hard to see, but you have a group of Quakers uh, peaceably negotiating with Native Americans, right? And so in the post-millennial vision, Christians take over the world and create the kingdom of God on earth. And we, and then everything is, is great. And all the animals and all the people are very happy. So in post-millennialism, Christians are empowered to build the messianic kingdom of God on the earth. 
and they progressively reform all societies to bring them into godliness. It's a form of Christian triumphalism, right? Christians will triumph. Now, premillennialism, let me give you an image here. This is actually an image from the, that harkens back to my own childhood. This is from the movie poster for a film that came out, an evangelical horror film that might sound like a contradiction in terms, but it's a real thing, called A Thief in the Night, came out in 1972. And in A Thief in the Night, which is very much built around this idea of the rapture, where Christians suddenly disappear. Jesus takes away all the Christians. And um, so in A Thief in the Night, the rapture happens, and suddenly you're in the apocalypse. All the Christians are gone, and everyone else has to figure out what to do. And there's this group trying to take over and turn into a one-world government, and you have technology that's scary. That is the worldview of many premillennialists, right? The, the idea of premillennialism is that Christians' task is to spread the gospel and then wait for Jesus to come back and establish the millennium or the messianic age on the earth. So this is, if, if postmillennialism is optimistic about Christian supremacy and Christian takeover, Christian triumph, premillennialism is pessimistic. The world's going to get worse and worse until Jesus comes back and fixes everything. Okay? So here's the question that I want you to go into your, um, your, your breakout rooms to discuss. Which of these forms of Christian millennialism, now that you're an expert on Christian eschatology, which of these forms of Christian millennialism do you think has led to more Christian support for the modern state of Israel? And when you get back, I'm going to have you take a poll and actually answer this question. So I want you to pick one. You don't have to all agree as a group, but I want you to discuss in your groups, come back, you're going to have to pick one, all right? I'm going to give you 10 minutes, so when you get in there, there are facilitators there who will um, help guide the conversation, make sure you introduce yourselves, but take 10 minutes, try to come up with a um, an answer to this question, and we'll, we'll take a poll when you get back, all right? See you in 10 minutes. All more or less return a couple more people coming in okay <laughs> my experts on christian eschatology i am going to put a poll on the screen you have to vote on which of these forms of christian millennialism you think has had a more has, had, has led to more christian support for the modern state of israel please choose one post-millennialism or pre-millennialism Ooh, participation this is great all right, I got 26, I guess that's 27. There we go. We're going to end the poll right there. Let me put the results on the screen for you. Okay, so it looks like we came out 57% premillennialism and 43% postmillennialism. I'll just say to all of you, good job, because you're both correct. Um, so let's get into this a little more. So I'm going to share my screen again here. So let's talk about Postmillennialism and premillennialism a little bit more. Um, so, I I actually think if you've come into this with some background on these questions, that background might not be very helpful because I think it's it's less helpful. And this is the way these things are commonly set up. They're they're commonly set up as opposites, right? They're commonly presented as kind of opposing Christian eschatologies. But if you think about it, actually, the opposing eschatology in the Christian tradition is amillennialism, which says you all are way too literal minded about this thing. We're just don't 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 get hung up on it, right? Both postmillennialism and premillennialism have this investment in a sort of future eschatology. And I would think of them more as different moods or temperaments of Christian millennialism, right? They're both forms of Christian millenarianism. One is more optimistic and one is more pessimistic, right? And so um actually both of those temperaments. Um, of Protestant eschatology, postmillennialism and premillennialism, have contributed significantly to Christian support for the state of Israel, because they both tend to see the reconstitution of Israel as a necessary event in Christian eschatology. They might have differing opinions about when exactly it needs to happen, but they are both very invested in this kind of future-oriented, looking for the fulfillment of these biblical prophecies. In fact, some Protestants began speaking about and even advocating for the reconstitution of the state of Israel as early as the late 1500s, right? So Jewish Zionism really kicks off in the late 19th century, right, the late 1800s. But you have Christians in the late 1500s, these Protestants who are reading the Bible in these apocalyptic ways, who are starting to argue for 
um, the, the reconstitution of the state of Israel. And sometimes they're using more of a post-millennialist mood, and sometimes they're using more of a pre-millennialist mood. So this advocacy for Christian, or the Christian advocacy for a state of Israel, a reconstituted state of Israel, it starts in Great Britain, but then it migrates to the American colonies and then ultimately to the U.S. Uh, once it's formed as well. So let me give you a quick timeline here that just gives you a sense of how this is going. So, right, the, the Protestant Reformation kicks off roughly in 1517 with Luther's 95 Theses, right around the, the, right around the year 1500. And then, of course, we're in the year 2023 now, right? So across those 500 or so years, you have the Protestant Reformation. But up until that point, as I said, most Christians are amillennial up until the Reformation. And then you start to have some of these divergent interpretations that occur. In the era of the American Revolution, and in fact, for, for uh, a number of decades prior to the American Revolution, post-millennialism became the dominant mood amongst Protestants, especially in the US. And the, in this era, people didn't really talk about Christian Zionism, that term didn't exist yet, but people talked about Jewish restorationism which is Christians believing in a Jewish restoration to the state of Israel. Now, post-millennialism, again, is a very optimistic vision, and this was the optimism that fueled the Puritans, the optimism that fueled um, 19th century evangelicalism, and then you run smack dab into the Civil War. And in the Civil War, you have Christians, especially evangelical Christians, fighting against their fellow evangelical Christians, all believing that they are building the kingdom of God either in the North or the South. And so after the Civil War, you have this pivot that goes on in the temperament of American evangelicalism to where premillennialism becomes the dominant mood of eschatology after the Civil War. And then, of course, you have the founding of the State of Israel in 1948. So, and it's with this move towards premillennialism that the term Christian Zionism gets coined and that you really get kind of the formal movement. But long before... There's this premillennial mood that we still are, are have lingering around today. You have this postmillennial mode. And I want to talk about both of those and the, the significance of both of them. So, and I also want to highlight what we, we've got about 20, 25 minutes left, and then we'll have some time for QA. But I want to highlight some of the strange friendships that emerge between Jews and Christians in these different eras, and the ways that those might reflect some of the, 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 the awkwardness of Jewish Christian relations that we've already seen. Okay. So let's talk about postmillennial. Jewish restorationism. So this is the view that's held especially by the Puritans in Great Britain, who are blending kind of this Calvinist theology with some of the elements of the radical Reformation with the Church of England. The Puritans are a wild mix of Protestantisms. And for Puritans, post-millennialism powers their ambition, right? The Puritans, especially those who come to New England, believe that they are creating the model in New England of the millennial kingdom. Right? This is what that famous sermon about, we're a city on a hill that everyone likes to quote about. That is about the Puritans forming in the colonies in New England, a, a the millennial kingdom becoming a model for this post-millennial vision of Christian triumphalism. Now, this post-millennialism form of Christian Zionism or Jewish restorationism tends to emphasize both the conversion of the Jews to Christianity and Jewish restoration to the land of Israel as simultaneous Christian goals. And the post-millennialists actually debate amongst themselves about which of these is going to come first. Do the Jews all need to convert to Christianity and then God will restore them and give them their state back? Or will God give them their state back and they'll be so grateful that they'll all convert to Christianity, right? This is some of the debates in terms of this. So in post-millennialism, supersessionism and the Christianization of Jews and Judaism is of a piece with the Christianization of the whole world. Right, the post-millennialists believe that the church is going to take over the whole world, reform every society, and so the belief that Jews are going to all convert to Christianity and that they're going to reconstitute the nation of Israel—that that that's of a piece, right? Because this is all it all fits together into the scheme of Christian triumphalism. So there's different organizations that emerge out of this post-millennialist side of things. Um, one of the most famous ones is called the London Society for Promoting Christianity Amongst the Jews. It's founded in 1809, uh, very rapidly gets adopted by the Church of England as one of their mission agencies. Um, and um, one of the key leaders here is this guy, Joseph Samuel Frey, who was an Orthodox Polish um, uh, uh, Jew, and he's a former rabbinical student. He winds up converting to Christianity in 1798, 
and begins really working with this London Society for Promoting Christianity Amongst the Jews. And they, I mean, there's still buildings in Israel built by the London Society for Promoting Christianity Amongst the Jews, right? Now, Frey actually becomes kind of frustrated because the Church of England has taken over this agency and they're doing too much work. So he actually migrates to the U.S. and he helps to found the U.S. version of this, which is less well known, and that is called the American Society for Meliorating the Condition of the Jews. Talk about your euphemisms here. And you might say, well, Matt, doesn't the word ameliorating start with an A? Your, your battle is with 19th century spellers, not with me. Um, and so this gets founded in 1820 in the U.S. And at the founding meeting of the American Society for Ameliorating the Condition of the Jews, um, Elias Boudinot, who's a fa fairly prominent statesman in early America, gets up, he's the president, and he gives, he says this in his inaugural address. We Christians are assured by unerring truth that in all these severe and unheard of sufferings of this unfortunate nation, the Jews, that they will see their error. They will repent and turn unto the Lord their God, that he will have mercy upon them and restore them to their ancient city and set them chief among the nations of the earth. Now, there are only about 3,000 Jews living in the U.S. in 1820, but this uh, American Society for Ameliorating the Condition of the Jews includes supporters like John Quincy Adams, the presidents of Yale and Harvard are supporters of this society, right? This is a Christian post-millennialist society hoping to convert the Jews. Now, there's a fascinating figure who emerges in this era as well, and his name is Mordecai Manuel Noah. So Mordecai Manuel Noah, born in 1785, dies in 1851. So kind of is born right in, in that kind of era the, uh, between the American Revolution and the Constitutional Convention. And um, he is just a really interesting character. He's a journalist, he's a playwright, a diplomat. He actually serves as the first US consul to the city of Tunis, modern Tunisia. And he's maybe the most prominent American Jew of his era. I mean, again, there's only about 3,000 Jews in the U.S. in his era. So, but he is he is kind of one of the force. And he's in conversation with a lot of the most famous figures in American history in this era. He's he's a vocal advocate for slavery and a noted racist. Um, and some of his uh, some some of the sources, historical sources, actually credit him with inventing the the minstrel show, which becomes. Uh, 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 this this, for, this artistic, I guess you call it artistic, form of um, racism, uh, of caricaturing African-American people uh, that becomes a form of entertainment, a very racist form of entertainment. And, and Noah is, is credited as the one who, at least according to some sources, who created that. Um, he's an advocate for slavery, but he's also an advocate for Jewish immigration to the U.S. In fact, uh, former President John Adams writes to Mordecai Noah in 1819, I could find it in my heart to wish that you, Noah, had been at the head of a hundred thousand Israelites and marching with them into Judea and making a conquest of that country and restoring your nation to the dominion of it. For I really wish the Jews again in Judea an independent nation. All right, so Morde Mordecai Emmanuel Noah is hobnobbing with all these former presidents, presidents of Yale and Harvard, all kind of who are fascinated with Jews and want to promote Christianity amongst Jews. He winds up actually partnering with this American society for the ameliorating the condition of the Jews. In fact, their original title for the society was the American Society for Evangelizing the Jews. Mordecai Noah, who's a pretty prominent journalist in, in, in that era, comes along and is like, mm, bad title. Why don't we go with something else? And that's how they come to this title, right? And he really, I would argue, pioneers an approach by which Christians and Jews could work together politically to establish a Jewish state, but for very different motivations. He is not on board with this idea of evangelizing the Jews, but he's working with Christian missionaries who explicitly are. And, and so what happens is Mordecai Noah, in partnership with this American Society for Ameliorating the Condition of the Jews, actually try, goes and purchases an island in upstate New York. It's just downstream from Niagara Falls. Big island, right in the middle of the river there. And um, in 1825, he, he purchases this in partnership with this American Society for Ameliorating the Condition of the Jews as a kind of proto-Zionist Jewish reservation. And he wants to encourage Jews to migrate to the U.S. from Europe in order to learn American ways, American democracy, and then go from there to go and found a state in Israel. 
Now, this whole plan does not work at all. And there's not a single Jew that migrates and joins this colony on Grand Island and it never comes to anything. But he actually names the colony Ararat, which if you remember is, is the uh, mountain that Noah lands on in the, in the biblical narrative. Right, so it's kind of a waypoint, and and Mordecai Noah declares himself the judge, right, referring to the book of Judges over the Jewish people. The Jewish people did not recognize him as such. But he declared it, and so this is the, the this is something that's going on in that era. Another fascinating character in this era is an associate and friend of Mordecai Noah's. His name is Warder Warder Cresson. He's an, he's a Philadelphian. He's a Quaker, and he's a millenarian, right? He believes in all these millenarian ideas about the millennium. And um, he becomes convinced of Noah's program, becomes convinced uh, that Noah is doing the right thing. And he asked for Noah's advocacy, and he winds up getting appointed as the first U.S. consul to Jerusalem in 1844, is this guy, Warder Crescent. He gets to Jerusalem, and he winds up converting to Judaism. So Warder Crescent, this Christian who starts out trying to convert Jews to Christianity, goes as the first U.S. consul to Jerusalem and converts to Judaism. And when he comes back from Jerusalem to Philadelphia, his wife and children put him on trial for lunacy because they say there is no way that any Christian would convert to Judaism. And he loses the trial and is declared a lunatic. And he actually has to appeal the verdict. He wins on appeal on the basis of religious freedom. And he winds up convert, like marrying a uh, Sephardic Jew. And he returns to Jerusalem, settles there, under the name Michael Boaz Israel Ben Abraham. Right? So these are these strange friendships, the strange dynamics that are going on in the midst of all this. So that's the post-millennialist side. Now let's talk about the pre-millennialist side. Um, so again, as I said, after the Civil War, there's this, this growing pessimism amongst American evangelicals about the church, about society. And so Premillennialism grows rapidly, right? All this optimism of postmillennialism is a lot harder to hold together as you have these fractures that emerge within the Christian community. So these premillennialists tend to emphasize the recreation of the state of Israel as a precondition for Jesus' return. So remember, Jesus has to come back before the millennium. So they're not as interested in Jewish conversion right now, per se, but they're hoping the Jews will ultimately convert after Jesus comes back. Jesus will convert all the Jews. And, and so this transition from evangelical postmillennialism to evangelical premillennialism is largely facilitated by the spread of a theology called dispensationalism, which is a form of premillennialism. Not all premillennialists are dispensationalists, but all dispensationalists are premillennialists. So it's a subset of premillennialists that divides up human history into different dispensations of God's grace and God's covenants with humanity, especially with Israel. So I would say, and this is a bit of a snarky comment, that dispensationalism is what happens when apocalyptically oriented engineers with few literary sensibilities read the Christian Bible. Dispensationalists believe everything has to have a place. Everything has to fit in. And they're very fond of drawing elaborate diagrams that tell you the whole story of the Bible in a single diagram, or that give you the whole scope. Here's all seven of the dispensations that God has, has had with humanity, that sort of thing. So dispensationalism is explicitly trying to let go of supersessionism. They, they want to say all of that idea of Christians replacing Jews, all of that is wrongheaded. And instead, they situate Christianity within Judaism. So instead of saying, Christianity and the classic supersession of Christianity sits on top of Judaism. And so they say Christianity is actually a parenthesis within Judaism. And so you can see, even in this little diagram I have here, and I'll, I'll do a little call out so you can see them a little better. So here, they, in, in this more elaborate diagram, they have this little section down here with the Mosaic covenant, right? And then there's a parenthesis, right? And it says, while Israel is scattered, this covenant is not in force. When renewed, it becomes the Palestinian covenant, not referring to the Palestinian people, but the land of Palestine, okay? So what this chart is trying to tell us is a physical restoration of Israel to quote-unquote Palestine, the region of Palestine, is the sign of the renewal of the Mosaic covenant. And that is what makes possible the millennium, 
which on the, the diagram you can kind of see there is called the messianic dispensation, right? This text, this diagram, this is written in 1914. This is not happening on the eve of the founding of the state of Israel. It's not happening after 1914. This is happening as an expression of Christian Zionism and Christian theology in 1914. Let me give you another chart from the same book. This is a book called Dispensational Truth, uh, for, again, first published in 1914. This is the millennialist, the, the, or excuse me, the, the, the dispensationalist attempt to diagram the entire Bible. Um, and obviously, everyone here gets this perfectly. I don't need to explain it at all. So we're just going to move on. I'm just kidding. This is a very complicated chart, right? Let me, let me just highlight a couple of things. Because really, if you want to spend a few hours of your life that you will treasure forever, go and just Google dispensationalism chart. You will be in, you will encounter endless fascinating images and really strange ways that people in the late 19th and early 20th century tried to put together the Bible. But anyway, this chart you have a, 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 here this this little section here it says Jews cast among the nations, and it also says these are the times of the Gentiles. This is according to dispensationalists the era of the church. And if you notice, it's kind of built into the chart here, but you have. This sort of parenthesis. All of the chart is about Israel and the story of Israel in the past and the future. But this tiny section in the middle, that's Christianity. That's the church. That's the era that we're in right now where the Jews are cast among the nations. And then after the era of the church, you have the millennium, right? And this is where you have the section, the kingdom age, the millennial reign of Christ. And notice what else it says. Israel supreme, because Jesus will come back, all the Jews will convert, they will no longer be cast among the nations, they will come back to Israel, they'll convert, and Jesus will rule the world from Jerusalem with, the, with Israel, and Israel will be supreme, right? So this is dispensationalism. This is this, this kind of mood of theology that takes over in evangelicalism after the Civil War. Now, I want to tell another story, but in order to get there, we need to, we need to do a little, little background. So um, Jewish Zionism in the pre-World War I era, right? So Jewish Zionism kicks off in the, the late 19th century in the 1880s, 1890s. Um, and so in that era, before World War I and what's called the Balfour Declaration in 1917, Jewish Zionism was primarily a European movement with only a few thousand Jewish supporters in the U.S. supporting the movement of Zionism. And largely this was because Reform Judaism, the most dominant strand of Judaism in the time, at the time, was mostly opposed to Zionism at that time. Because Reform Judaism was trying to push a program of Jewish integration into the U.S., into U.S. society, into U.S. culture, and they saw the Zionists as pursuing this eccentric other thing. Now, in Europe, especially in Eastern Europe, you have pogroms and, and awful anti-Semitism, persecution of Jews. And so people in Europe are very, Jews in Europe are very anxious to try to find some way to create a Jewish state for, for their own protection. But in America, that's not happening, at least not nearly to that degree. And so the American Jewish community is by and large not that interested in Zionism in the pre-World War I era. And so instead, what you find is a lot, the, the, the small group of American Jews who are Zionists tend to partner up and make common cause with the Christian Zionists, who are much more dominant. And one of the most prominent Christian Zionists in the U.S. is a guy named William Blackstone. William Blackstone um, is he's an evangelical dispensationalist, so he's, he, he loves those kind of charts that we just looked at. And he becomes convinced in the 1870s that the Jews would have to be restored to the Holy Land so that the rapture would happen, right? The rapture is, comes in really with dispensationalism. That's where this idea really gets started, is the idea of the rapture. And, and so Blackstone believes the rapture is gonna, needs to happen, but first the, the Jews have to come back to the Holy Land, then the rapture will happen, and then all the Jews will convert to Christianity. He's also very gravely concerned about this rising anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe and Russia. And so in 1890, William Blackstone gathers a group of Christian leaders in Chicago for what is called the Conference on the Past, Present, and Future of Israel in 1890. In 1891, those same people who organized that conference along with Blackstone create what is called the Blackstone Memorial, which is a petition to world leaders, and especially to President Benjamin Harrison, 
that the Jews be given the Holy Land as a national homeland. Okay, so 1891, Blackstone organizes this petition, sends it to world leaders, and especially to President Harrison, arguing that Jews should be given the Holy Land as, their, as a national homeland. Here's a quote from the letter that he sends to Benjamin Harrison. There seem to be many evidences to show that we have reached the period in the great roll of centuries when the everlasting God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is lifting up his hand to the Gentiles to bring his sons and his daughters from far, that he may plant them again in their own land, Ezekiel 34, etc. Not for 24 centuries since the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, has there been offered to any mortal such a privileged opportunity to further the purposes of God concerning his ancient people. Talk about buttering up a U.S. president, right? This Blackstone Memorial was signed by John D. Rockefeller, by J.P. Morgan, by many senators and congressmen and college presidents in the United States. It's worth noting that all of this is going on in 1891, four years before Theodore Herzl writes the book, The Jewish State, that crystallizes conversations about Zionism in the European Jewish community. So this is happening independent of the, this organization of European Zionism. This Christian Zionism in the U.S. is already really taking hold. Now, fast forward to World War I, and this is the story that I really enjoy. Blackstone, is, is he's still around. He's still a leader in this movement. He develops friendships and partnerships with lead, many of the leading Jewish Zionists in America, including Nathan Strauss, the owner of Macy's Department Stores, Louis Brandeis, the first Jewish Supreme Court Justice, and Stephen Weiss, a very prominent Reform rabbi. So these three very significant Jewish leaders, the first Jewish Supreme Court Justice, owner of Macy's Department Store, one of the leading Reform rabbis, they're all friends with William Blackstone. And they, we have their correspondence where they're writing letters, and their letters are very affectionate back and forth amongst themselves. In fact, Strauss, the owner of Macy's, writes a letter to Blackstone at one point saying he and Brandeis are going around calling Blackstone, quote, the father of Zionism because Blackstone's work on behalf of the Jewish nation state predates that of Herzl. It's kind of saying like, oh, everyone's saying so many great things about Theodore Herzl, but we know you're the real father of Zionism. That's what Strauss writes to Blackstone. This is a very strange friendship. Because Blackstone is convinced that the rapture is going to happen at any moment. Remember, this is World War I. The world is melting down. Apocalypticism seems pretty reasonable. And he believes that his Jewish friends, who don't convert to Christianity right now, are going to be left on the earth to face great tribulations after the rapture, and then ultimately convert to Christianity before the second coming of Jesus. And Blackstone openly talks about these ideas of the rapture, and his worry for his Jewish friends in his correspondence with them. In fact, in 1917, William Blackstone is overseeing a trust that is established, this pool of money that is established for the sake of world evangelism, that is established by the oil magnate Milton Stewart. And Milton Stewart gives this money to Blackstone to lead this campaign on world evangelism, but Blackstone is really worried that the money won't get used if the rapture happens. So he reaches out to his friend, who is a Supreme Court Justice, Louis Brandeis. And Blackstone gets Brandeis to agree to draw up legal paperwork that will transfer this pool of money into Brandeis's control if the rapture happens. And not only does Louis Brandeis draw up this legal paperwork, he takes out a safe deposit box where he puts all this paperwork along with a bunch of Christian evangelization tracts directed towards Jews and sealed documents that he can only open after the rapture. All this is under Blackstone's instructions. So Louis Brandeis, first Jewish Supreme Court justice in the United States, had a, a, a safety deposit box full of Christian tracts for Jews that he could only open in the case of the rapture. It's a strange friendship, but it is all happening under this heading of Christian Zionism. So when we come to the founding of the state of Israel a few decades later in 1948, there's a lot of factors that go into that, right? You have the, the formation of the UN. One of the first things the UN does is to create the state of Israel. You have World War II and the Holocaust and all the brutality of World War II. You have the, 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 the kind of shuffling that's going on among nation states. You have Jewish Zionism in Europe, but you also have Christian Zionism, particularly in the U.S. There's a key contributing factor to the founding of the state of Israel. 
right? Many of these, many things go into this, but you cannot factor out the role of Christian Zionism in helping to lay the groundwork for a Jewish state. By the time the state of Israel is established in 1848, you've had several generations of world leaders being petitioned by evangelical Christians for the establishment of a Jewish state in the Eastern Mediterranean. And these were some of the most prominent Christians in America, and they were working with some of the greatest fortunes amassed in the Gilded Age. After the founding of the state of Israel, this continues in a long-standing alliance between the government of the state of Israel and Christian Zionists, where you have American evangelicals sending tourists and building an entire tourism industry in Israel that often caters to these eschatological ideas that evangelical Christians bring to Israel. You have Christian advocacy for the state of Israel through organizations like Christians United for Israel, which is maybe the most prominent Christian Zionist organization today. You have Christians voting for on, on the issue of Israel and a lot of the evangelical alignment today around the Republican Party. If you boil it down, come, a lot of it is connected to Israel and the, the their view of Israel. But on the other side of this partnership, you have the state of Israel as well that is offering friendships these Christian Zionists. Why is a guy like Robert Jeffress getting to pray at the, the, the opening of the U.S. embassy in Jerusalem? Because of this long-standing alliance between Christian Zionists and the state of Israel. You have the, the, the government of the state of Israel often hosting these folks, allowing and tacitly seemingly approving of some of their programs. Sometimes they're jointly sponsored programs. You have outreach from the different um, governments of Israel, the different regimes, the different, the different elected governments of Israel, in partnership with and friendship with and alliance with these Christian Zionists. We'll think a little bit more about this next week. So let me offer a few concluding thoughts, and then hopefully we have a, a good amount of time for a few questions. Okay. So Christian Zionism is driven by Protestant eschatologies but also by these same dueling supersessionism and philo-Semitism aspects to early Christian theology, right? It's still all the same ideas kind of spooling out and, and showing up in these kind of Protestant eschatologies. And post-millennialism and premillennialism have both contributed significantly to Christian support for the state of Israel, but most of us have probably grown up and, and been formed in the era where this premillennialist mood of Christian Zionism is predominant, right? Christians supporting Israel and waiting on Jesus to return to set the world right and convert the Jews, because that has been the dominant mood of evangelical eschatology in the 20th century. But what happens if a post-millennialist mood returns? And I'm going to talk next week because I think we are in the midst of a turning of the tide in evangelical eschatology that very few people are paying attention to, that is happening under our feet, and that is going to radically affect the relationship between Jews and Christians. We'll get there next week. Third point, we will have a sharper analysis of the Israel-American alliance if we recognize that the American Jewish community is not necessarily the sole or even the primary driving force in many of the foreign policy moves that the U.S. makes towards Israel or vice versa, right? As I said, the Jewish American community is pretty divided on these questions around Israel. Pretty conflicted. There's a lot of internal debates. It's the evangelical supporters of Israel that drive so much of this foreign policy relationship. And last point, and then we'll I'll take a few questions. Interreligious cooperation and alliances can exist without interreligious dialogue. Right? Many Jews and many Christians have a lot at stake in Israel. But what they have at stake in Israel is actually pretty different. And they're coming to the support for very different reasons. Sometimes I worry that the things that they want are so important to them on both sides of this relationship, on both sides of this alliance. What they want is so important to them that it's very hard for them to talk about what they actually want and what's behind that. And I worry about the distortion that that can bring to Jewish Christian relations overall. As you have this close alliance, close partnership, cooperation, but not really a conversation about what's underneath that. Sometimes even an intentional bracketing of what's underneath that for the sake of the cooperation. Okay, I am going to stop talking there. And let me see, the, it looks like we have at least three questions. Um, so uh, the first question is, um, it, it, I think this is in reference to um, the, uh, the, the survey that Pew did in 2013. 
is this quote unquote Israel as the modern nation state or Israel as the land promised to Abraham and Sarah and their descendants? Um, I would say that most, um, you, you can have a debate on um, how, how different Jewish interpreters are, are understanding the question that Pew posed. I think most evangelical Christians especially would not make any distinction between those things, right? They would not, they would not say, oh, well, there was an ancient state of Israel and then there's a modern state of Israel, and they're very different things. They, they would say the, the modern state of Israel is the, the reconstitution of the ancient state of Israel, right? Um, and I've even heard evangelicals um, refer back to, like, the people in Jesus' era or the people in the Hebrew Bible as Israelis, right? That's not actually the preferred terminology. We usually talk about Israelites in the ancient sense, and Israelis as people who are modern citizens of the state of Israel. Right, but that tends to get actually conflated in a lot of for a lot of evangelicals. They don't they see a sort of kind of continuity, at least with, with this big rupture in the middle, but a continuity between the modern and the ancient state. Um, and, and that is part of what's Felix is it's a theological continuity, it's not a um a necessarily a rational continuity. Okay. Um so I I already talked some somebody asked about the rapture. The rapture really comes in through dispensationalism. You don't have people really talking about the rapture prior to the spread of dispensationalism. Um, there, today, there are some um, premillennialists who believe in the rapture who might not be dispensationalists, but it's, it's a kind of marginal phenomenon. Um, another question is, does Christian millennialism posit the reconstitution of Israel as a condition of Christ's return? Um, in, most for, in, in most forms of post-millennialism, yes. Right, but the reconstitution of the state of Israel again, because post millennialists believe the church does it all with God's help, then the church helps to bring that about. And there's debates about do all the Jews have to convert first? In pre millennialism, um, most forms of pre millennialism would also say yes, the reconstitution of Israel is a condition of Christ's return um, in order to set up the millennium, and then the Jews will convert after after Jesus returns. Um, did the formation of Israel um, because of Christian Zionism lead to a negative impact on the Middle East with respect to Palestinians? Um, yes. <laughs> um, the, the, I, I, don't, I don't know any other way to answer that question. The, so obviously, I mean, you can have, we can have a lot of opinions and debates about um, the, the rightness, the justice of founding the state of Israel in the aftermath of the Holocaust giving a, a space where Jewish people are protected. But I, I don't think there's any way to say that the Palestinians have wound up on the great end of this whole endeavor, right? Um, many, many Palestinian people are killed and displaced when the state of Israel is created. And then we'll talk next week about the, the 1967 war. Um, I mean, the, the, the Palestinian people are, are um, have, have suffered greatly in, in the midst of all of these kind of um, uh, efforts to create the state of Israel. Um, again, you might you might think that, that suffering is justified for the good of creating the state of Israel, but I don't, I don't know if there's any way from a Palestinian perspective to say like this has been a really really happy occurrence for them. Um, okay, and then the last question here, and, and and I'm happy to stick on around for a few minutes if anybody has other questions. Um, is there a difference between Hebrews and Israelites as it relates to Christian Zionism versus Christian nationalism? Whew, um, that's a big question. Um, so. Uh, the term Hebrew and Israelite are generally interchangeable in reference to the ancient people of Israel. Sometimes people will prefer one or, over the other. Um, and what, one of the things we'll talk about next week um, is there's a changeover that occurs um, in terminology around Messianic Judaism. Up in, there, there, I mean, there have always been people who come from a Jewish background who become Christians. Right, that, I mean, that, that's where Christianity starts. This is a phenomenon that has occurred throughout history. But most of those, up until the 1970s, none of those people referred to themselves as Messianic Jews. That terminology did not really exist. Up until then, they were largely calling themselves Hebrew Christians. And it's ha and in in the 1970s that this term of Messianic Judaism arises. So yes, the names that are attached to people is is important. Um, and um, so we'll, but we'll talk about that some next week. Okay, it is 8.31. Our time is over. Thank you for joining us this week. Please come back next week as we talk about Messianic Judaism, some of the things that happened after the founding of the state of Israel. 
the, some of the more of what happens in the U.S. We're also going to look at the role that Christian Zionism and Messianic Judaism played in the Capitol riot and why symbols from Messianic Judaism and Christian Zionism were so prominently displayed during the Capitol riot. So come back for that. Thank you for, for joining us tonight. We'll see you again.